All right, welcome to lesson 5-4. Today we're gonna look at probably one of the most commonly used techniques for integration, and this is called integration by substitution. Now to sort of put this in a frame of reference, think back to unit two when you were learning about all the different methods of finding the derivative. And one of the most common derivative rules that you learned was the chain rule. And remember the chain rule was when you had basically a composite function, so a function within another function. Well, just like it was for derivatives, when integrating, many of the functions that we try to integrate are also compositions of functions or the result of differentiating a composition of functions. So what integration by substitution is, is really a technique to undo the chain rule. So that's what this is. So first, let's just kind of quickly review what the chain rule looks like for derivatives. And we'll do that using this particular function right here. So we have f of x equals the quantity x cubed plus 2 to the seventh power. And so hopefully you remember that at the time, what we would do is we would look for that inner function, that inside function. So something inside parentheses. It might be in the argument of a trig function. It might be the entire numerator or the entire denominator of a fraction. Uh, it might be inside of a radical. So remember, these are all the different things that we would look for for that u. Okay, so in this case, clearly our u should be x cubed plus 2. And so remember then what that means is that f prime, the derivative, is going to be uh, the derivative of u to the seventh times the derivative of u. So that means we're going to have 7u to the 6th times the derivative of x cubed plus 2. So when we substitute back in, that's going to give me 7 times x cubed plus 2 to the 6th times the derivative of x cubed plus 2, which is 3x squared. And then finally, we can multiply the 7 and the 3, and that's going to give us a 21 x squared times x cubed plus 2 to the sixth. Okay, so remember, this is how we would find the derivative using the chain rule. And just again, a couple of things to keep in mind. Remember that at the end, what you had originally chosen as your u still shows up there. It still appears in there. And then again, this 21x squared, think about where that came from. That was the result of u prime. Now, yes, it was multiplied by the constant as well, but 21x squared is made up of u prime, or the derivative of u. So that was the derivative using the chain rule. So now let's think about how we would reverse this. And first of all, the, the, the way that you would realize that we would need to use integration by substitution, as opposed to what you just did back in lesson 5-1, if you look at the integrand here, this is not simply term by term being added or subtracted. Now, it is being multiplied and it's to a power. So we could technically expand this, but because it's to the sixth power, I don't think any of us have any interest in trying to expand that and then distribute a 21x squared into that afterwards. So this is a good situation for us to recognize that we would not be able to just use basic integration techniques. We would probably need to consider something like integration by substitution. Okay, so the first thing I would recognize then is I do once again have something inside parentheses. And so just like when we were doing the derivative, I would want to notice that that is a good candidate for my u. So again, x cubed plus 2 is still going to be my u. Now remember that the result of the chain rule incorporated the derivative of u. So the notation here is going to be a little bit different, but it's the same idea. So we would do the derivative of u with respect to x is going to just be 3x squared. But that dx, we're actually going to sort of multiply it up to the other side. So we're actually going to rewrite this as du equals 3x squared times dx. That's how we would actually end up writing it. So again, we're not going to keep it as a du dx, even though that's technically what we found. We're going to write it as du equals 3x squared times dx. 
Okay, so now what we can do is we can actually solve this equation here for dx, which means I'm going to have du divided by 3x squared. So the reason this is called integration by substitution is that it does involve two major substitutions. So the first substitution is for what we identified as our u. So the first thing I'm going to do is, let's go ahead and put the 21x squared, parentheses, to the sixth. But remember, this was our u. And then we had our dx. But now our dx, remember, is du over 3x squared. So I can now rewrite that as du over 3x squared. Because remember, the problem is, if this says dx, that means everything in my integrand should be in terms of x. And as soon as I introduce that u, that throws things off. So we need everything now to be in terms of u instead. So now that I've substituted the dx with du over 3x squared, notice that the x squares can actually divide out. And then that 3 divides with the 21 to leave us with the 7. And so finally, we now have the integral of 7u to the 6th du. And now this just looks like the basic antiderivatives that you learned in lesson 5-1. And that's what integration by substitution is trying to do, is it's giving us a method for substituting so that our more complex integrand turns into a basic integrand, where we can just find the antiderivative using a reverse power rule. So when I use the reverse power rule here, this is now going to become 7u to the 7th divided by 7. And then don't forget plus the constant of integration. Those sevens divide out. And then we just have u to the seventh plus c. And then remember, the final step is to replace the u back. So this is x to the third plus 2 to the seventh plus c. And remember, that was the original function, although this does have that extra plus c. Because remember, we could add any constant to the end of that function, and its derivative would be the same. So what I illustrated for you right here, that is integration by substitution. That's the method that you're working on today. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about correctly identifying that u, because that's going to be maybe part of the trickier thing here. OK, so here are some tips for choosing or identifying your u. And of course, these tips aren't going to be 100% foolproof, but it's a really great place to start. So um, first, of course, any inner expression that you see. So anything that's inside parentheses, inside of a radical, inside the argument of a trig function, uh, inside the entire numerator or denominator of a fraction, those are some really good uh, candidates for your choice of u. Um, oftentimes, another thing to consider is maybe it's the more complex looking expression of your integrand. So maybe you have lots of different expressions in your integrand, but maybe one part jumps out at you as being slightly more complicated looking. That might be a good choice for your u. Um, an expression containing a power that's one degree higher than another. Now, the reason that that's a good idea is, remember, if you're choosing your u to be something raised to a power, when you find the derivative of that, that power is going to knock down by 1. And so if you have a power of 7 and then a power of 6, the power of 7 expression might be a good choice for your u. So uh, related to that, think ahead. What would your du, the derivative of your u, turn out to be? Because remember that ultimately, whatever your du is, you should see something similar to that appear within your integrand as well. And then finally, never bother to choose your u as just x, because you're wasting your time. You're literally just swapping the variable, but you're not changing what the integrand looks like. Remember, the whole point of this substitution method is that we're changing what the integrand looks like. We're changing it from something more complex into something that's more basic, where we can actually integrate just using our basic antiderivative rules, meaning really the reverse power rule.
Okay, so these are your tips for choosing or identifying your you. Again, they are not 100% uh, you know, accurate all the time, but these are most likely going to get you through 99% of the problems that would get thrown at you. Okay, so let's go ahead and just look at several examples then. All right, so first we're going to integrate the integral of 2x times x squared plus 1 quantity to the fifth. So again, first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify our u, our inner function. Uh, this one has a pretty good candidate here. We've got x squared plus 1 inside the parentheses, so that seems to jump out at me as the best candidate for our u. And again, it's also a good candidate because this is x to the second, and I notice that elsewhere in my integrand, I have an x to the first. So again, an expression containing a power that's one degree higher than another is always a good choice as well. So that means I'm going to have u equals x squared plus 1. And if that's the case, then that means the derivative of u equals 2x dx. And then now I can solve for dx, and I get dx is equal to du divided by 2x. So now we can substitute. So I have the 2x times, now x squared plus 1, remember that's going to become my u to the fifth, and then times, remember dx is going to become du over 2x. So that's the substitution. Now I can see that the 2x completely divides out with the other 2x, and so now my integral becomes the integral of u to the fifth du. So again, notice that is significantly simpler than our original problem. And so now we can just integrate using our reverse power rule. So this becomes u to the sixth divided by six plus c. And then just don't forget, again, this is sort of the most common mistake, is forgetting to substitute back in for u. If your original integrand was in terms of x, then your final answer should also be in terms of x. If your original problem was in terms of theta, then your final answer should be in terms of theta. So don't forget to substitute at the end. Again, that is most the most common mistake that I see. All right, so finally we end up with, if I replace that u, I have x squared plus 1 to the 6th all over 6 plus c. And of course, you could alternatively write this as 1 sixth times x squared plus 1 to the sixth plus c. Either of those are fine. Doesn't matter. All right, next example. So I have the integral of sine of square root of x over the square root of x dx. All right, so again, first thing I have to do is try to figure out what should I let my u equal. Now, we are taking the sine of the square root of x, so for me, that tends to jump out at me first. Again, the argument of a trig function. So I'm going to let u equal the square root of x, which, remember, really, we want to think of as x to the 1 half. So that would make our du 1 half x to the negative one-half dx. Now I'm going to actually rewrite this a couple of times. So first, that means that du is really 1 over 2 square root of x dx. And so now, when I solve for dx, I multiply both sides by a 2 root x. And so dx equals 2 times the square root of x du. So now we can substitute. So I'm going to actually do this in a couple ways. This, um, the square root of x in the denominator, I'm going to actually move that out as a 1 over square root of x first times the sine of the square root of x, which is our u, and then times dx, which is 2 root x du. Okay, so now that square root of x and that square root of x actually divide out. 
And so what we now have is the integral of, I'm going to move this 2 in front, 2 times the sine of u du. So now this is a basic integral. But instead of using a power rule, we're just using our reverse, uh, our integration for trigonometric functions, which is, again, thinking in reverse for your derivatives. So if I have the integral of sine of u, remember that that's going to be a negative cosine of u. But we have that 2 there. So this is going to become negative 2 cosine of u plus c. And then finally, again, don't forget to substitute back in for u. And so we get negative 2 cosine square root of x plus c. All right, moving on. All right, so for this example, again, no surprise, as soon as I see a radical, I am going to rewrite that as a power. So this is really the integral of x to the third times x to the fourth plus 2 to the 1 half power. And so now I can see that our choice of u is most likely going to be x to the fourth plus 2. So let's give that a try. And so that would make our du become 4x to the third dx. And then when I solve for dx, that's going to give me du over 4x to the third. So now we can go ahead and substitute. So I have x to the third times u to the 1 half times our dx, which is actually equal to du over 4x to the third. So we can see now that the x to the thirds do divide out. I do still have that 4 in the denominator, which really, remember, is a 1 fourth. So what I now have is the integral of 1 fourth u to the 1 half du. And remember that that 1 fourth can go out in front. I could have done that in the previous example with that 2 as well. So now when we integrate, we get 1 fourth times, so this is going to be u to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves plus c. When I flip the 3 halves, that's going to become a 2 thirds times 1 fourth, which is 2 twelfths or 1 sixth. u to the 3 halves plus c. And then once again, don't forget to substitute the u back in at the end. And we get 1 sixth times x to the fourth plus 2 to the 3 halves plus c. All right, so for this example here, we have the integral of sine of x times cosine squared of x dx. So now in terms of choosing your u, maybe this one jumps out at you, but maybe it doesn't. There are a couple things to point out. So first of all, remember that cosine squared of x, what that really means is that we really have the integral of sine of x times the quantity cosine of x squared. So maybe that form right there makes your choice of u a little bit more straightforward. Here's another thing to consider. If you were to let u equal your sine of x, then your du would be cosine of x dx. Now, I do have a cosine of x, but I actually have two of them. So that's kind of a problem. It means we have more than we really wanted. But if I let my u equal cosine of x, then my du would be a negative sine of x. And I do have a sine of x. I would have an extra negative, but that's fine. Anytime you're trying to find your du or find your dx, if you have an extra constant that shows up, that's fine. But when you have extra functions or extra, val any extra x's, that's not so easy to deal with, OK? So for this one, again, I think our best choice would be to let u equal the cosine of x. And again, that was for two reasons. One, it's really the quantity cosine of x that's getting squared, so it's inside parentheses. But the other choice is, by letting u equal cosine of x, I can anticipate that du will be a negative sine of x 
and I do see a sine of x expression in my integrand. So that would now make my dx equal to du over negative sine of x. All right, so now when I substitute, I have the sine of x times u squared times dx, which remember is going to substitute with du over negative sine of x. So now the sine of x's go away. I do still have that leftover negative, so I'm going to move that out in front. So I have a negative integral of u squared du. So suddenly, something that started in terms of trig, notice it doesn't even have any trig at all in terms of the simplified integral that we're actually finding. So this now becomes negative u to the third over 3 plus c. And then finally, substitute back in. So I get negative 1 third. And remember, our u is cosine. So negative 1 third cosine cubed of x plus c. And again, of course, or you could have written this as negative cosine cubed of x all over 3 plus c. That's fine as well. Okay, and we're going to wrap up with this last example. So it says find the indefinite integral by making a change of variables. Now that seems sort of odd to have different directions when this looks pretty similar to what you've had in the past. And, and really, and by the past I mean like the last 10-15 minutes. And really this looks exactly the same and all of the other problems you were technically changing the variable, right? You were changing it from an x to a u. So how is this one different? We're going to notice that part way through. So just something to keep in mind, you will not always be given directions that are going to indicate that this problem is slightly different from any of the others, but I think you're going to notice very quickly what makes this one different. Okay, so we're going to start off the same way. First thing, I see a radical, so I'm going to rewrite this. So this is really x times the quantity 2x plus 1 to the 1 half power dx. Okay, so again, no big deal. I see something in parentheses, so that's going to jump out at me as my choice of u. So I'm going to let u equal 2x plus 1, and that means du equals 2 times dx, or in other words, dx is du over 2. So now I can substitute, so I'm going to have my x times, this now becomes u to the 1 half, and then dx, remember, becomes du over 2. Now remember, in all of the examples up to this point, the denominator of this dx substitution normally helped us cancel any remaining um, part of the chain rule. So in other words, this x normally would get canceled out by this substitution for the dx. But in this case, it doesn't. And remember, the problem is, if this is a du, then that means everything in this integrand has to be in terms of u. I can't have both an x and a u. So this is why the directions are talking about this whole change of variables thing. So not only did we have to do our substitution, but we have to figure out what we can do to make this x turn into a u. Well, if you haven't already figured it out, we defined something already that related x and u, and that was this expression right here, or that equation right there. We know that u is equal to 2x plus 1. So what that means then is I can solve that equation for x. So that means I'm going to have u minus 1 equals 2x, and so x equals u minus 1 over 2. So that means I can do one final substitution here, and that is to replace the x with u minus 1 over 2 times u to the 1 half times du over 2. So now I've got this 2 in the denominator here and this 2 in the denominator there. So that's now going to become the integral of 1 fourth times u minus 1 times u to the 1 half du. Now, before I go on, let me just point something out here. If we go back to the original 
expression for our integrand. Now notice this is 2x plus 1 to the 1 half and because this 2x plus 1 is being raised to a power other than just a plain 1, we can't distribute the x into that, right? We can't just make this a 2x squared plus x to the 1 half power. It doesn't work that way. So I can't distribute in there. But down here in this newly rewritten version, this u minus 1 is just to a first power. So that u to the 1 half can now be dis, uh, distributed in. And then that 1 fourth, again, it's a constant. So I could just move that out in front so we don't have to worry about it right now. And then when I distribute the u to the 1 half, this now gives me u to the 3 halves minus u to the 1 half du. And now this looks more like what we've been doing. So this now becomes 1 fourth times, so this is going to be u to the 5 halves divided by 5 halves minus u to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves and then plus c. Now there's a question about whether we should put the plus c in parentheses so that it's being multiplied by the 1 fourth or outside of the parentheses and the answer is it actually doesn't really matter. As long as we understand that this plus c outside of the parentheses is a little bit different from the C that we would have inside the parentheses in terms of its actual value, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes here. Okay, so now let's just go ahead and simplify this. So we've got 1 fourth times, so this is going to be 2 fifths times u to the 5 halves minus 2 thirds times u to the 3 halves, and then plus our constant C. And then finally, I'm going to do two things here at the end. I'm going to distribute the 1 fourth, and I'm going to substitute back for the u's. Remember, u is 2x plus 1. So this is going to become 2 twentieths or 1 tenth. So I have 1 tenth times 2x plus 1 to the 5 halves minus, now 1 fourth times 2 thirds is going to be 2 twelfths, which becomes 1 sixth times 2x plus 1 to the 3 halves, and finally plus that constant c. So this is an example of what's called uh, integrating by substitution using a change of variables. And so the idea is, even after doing your substitutions, you're still left over with another original variable as opposed to one being in terms of u. And in a situation like that, we do need to replace that leftover variable as well. And we can do that by going back to how we defined u and solving for the other variable. All right, good luck.